ego is when a person has a God complex. They got to be in charge. They got to run the show. And they desire the praise and the glory that should only be reserved for our Heavenly Father. That was King Nebuchadnezzar's problem. He had a theo ego, a God complex, if you will. That, that, that's what that, 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 that story about that golden statue that he erected to himself in Daniel chapter 3. We know the story. He, he builds this golden image and he puts out a decree that when you hear the music, you are to bow down and worship the statue. But there were three young men the kingdom, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who said, no, we can worship that image. Our God is a jealous God, and we're not to place anybody before him, and so we are not going to bow. They were called in, they were threatened with being thrown into the fire, and they said, we are not going to bow. We'll go in the fire, and our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, I wish I had a witness. We're not going to bow. King was so angry. Why? Because he had this theo ego. He had this God complex. They heat the fire up seven times hotter. But that night, the king was not able to sleep. Let me tell you something. It's hard to sleep when you've done the child of God wrong. It's it is hard to go to bed and rest at night. He got up, he looked into the fire, he scratches his head. Did we not go in three? But I see four walking around loose, and the fourth man looks like the Son of God. You would think then, Shay, that he had learned his lesson, but he had a Theo ego. Let me say the first word about the power of King Nebuchadnezzar. This was a powerful man. He was, he, he was the most powerful. He, he was feared. He was a mighty ruler of that day. He controlled the powerful kingdom of Babylon. Babylon was unrivaled in its military might. This man had some power. But the Bible clearly states that Nebuchadnezzar was in a place of power because of the will of God. You find that out in Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 10, where Nebuchadnezzar is called God's servant by God himself. He enjoyed the pinnacle of success and the power that he had because God had placed him there. Let me tell you something. There is no such thing as a self-made man. There's no such thing as a self-made woman. Any success that we enjoy in this life is a result of the sovereign will of God. Without God, we would all be still lost sinners on our way to hell. I need to tell somebody, if you've been fortunate to have any success in life, be careful that you give all the praise and glory to God because had it not been for God's grace and his mercy and his favor after all he's done for you, you owe him the glory. Every victory you win, you better give God the glory. Every battle you've been able to fight your way through, you better give God the glory. Every triumph, you better give God the glory. Every promotion on the job, you better give God the glory. Every good grade in school, you better give God the glory. He's a powerful man. God put him there, but he refuses to give God the glory. We see the scope of his power. We see the source of his power. But then look at the shame of his power. Even though Nebuchadnezzar was a great and a powerful king, he failed to acknowledge the power of God in his life. I mean, this man went as far as to take vessels of worship from the temple in Jerusalem 
and he brought them to Babylon to be offered as a tribute to his idol God. Here is a man who has forgotten where his help came from and he's now living his life independently from God who can he tell us nothing about God's will. I mean, this could be said about millions and millions of people on this earth. You know, they possess physical life, clarity of thought, reasonable intelligence, but they're dead to the things of God. They take life for granted. They ignore the God of the gospel. There are many people, even in church, who profess to be saved, but they won't allow God to call the shots in their life. They trust him for salvation, but they don't trust him as Lord. The power never been there. But then, look at, look at, secondly, the pride of never been there. You can see this man's pride. When you read this passage, he's brought face to face with the power of the God of Israel. He's confronted with the truth of who God is, and he's reminded where he is is because of God's power. Yet Nebuchadnezzar responded by worshiping Daniel instead of God. Listen, he proclaimed that the God of Daniel was a God among gods. A great God, no doubt, but God is just one of the gods. He would not submit and surrender to the fact that God was God all by himself. Bible says he's brought face to face with God himself when he opens the door to that fire furnace and he sees the Lord standing there. Yet at the end of the day, he fell short of total commitment to God. Even when he speaks about God, he lets God in with other gods. And so in the text, Daniel is called upon to interpret a dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And as he interprets this dream, Daniel is forced to tell the king that the dream is about you. The Bible says in verse 19 that Daniel reluctantly tells him with a heavy heart because he knew that as merciful as God is, there comes a time when God will show his judgment and Nebuchadnezzar's time has come. As Daniel closes his comments to the king, he pleads with Nebuchadnezzar to repent of his sins and turn back to God. Yet, we see the king continuing to live in pride and in arrogance, and he refuses to acknowledge God. He refuses to submit to the will of God, and now punishment has come. All because of pride. The first sin committed was because of pride. Sin entered through pride. The Bible tells us that pride goes before fall. We see the power of Nebuchadnezzar. We see the pride of Nebuchadnezzar. But now, let me talk about the punishment of Nebuchadnezzar. Because Nebuchadnezzar responded to the call of God in pride, and pride goes before destruction and a hearty spirit before a foul fall, the Bible says God pronounces judgment on him. The text teaches us when you study this that it took God a whole year to bring the judgment after the judgment was prophesied. That speaks to God's amazing grace and his mercy that even when he has planned to judge us, he still tries to give us some time to get right with God. Just because you've gotten by with a little sin for a little while, just because you've gotten away with a little sin for a little while, you may have forgotten about it, but God never forgets. He tries to give you mercy, but listen, you can force God do I have a witness? The Bible says that when judgment comes, he's walking around, 
prideful sister king. He's walking around in all of his arrogance, all of his kingdom, all of his wealth. But the Bible tells us one day Nebuchadnezzar is stricken with an affliction called lycanthropy. When you look up that word, lycan is a root word for wolf. Anthropos means man. He literally allows his mind to become twisted and he begins to believe that he is a wolf man. He loses his mind. Listen, you can walk around arrogant if you want to. You can test God if you want to. But all God has to do is touch a nerve in your brain and you won't even know who you are anymore. That's why it's so important to give God his rightful due. It's so important that we do not play with God. It's so important that we don't try to stare God down to make him blink first because just one touch from God will blow your mind. You don't believe me? Ask Jacob about it. When Jacob wrestled with God all night long. Listen, God wasn't playing with Jacob. One little touch and he's living for the rest of his life. The Bible tells us that for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar lives out in the woods, crawling around like a dog, scratching with claws from nails that have not been manicured, all because he tried God and lost. Let me help somebody. If you're out of the will of God, and the chastisement of God has not come upon your life yet, that means that you still have time to repent. I would advise you to listen to the call of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God and repent while there is still time. Because one thing I know about God, He's full of grace and He's full of mercy. I wish I had a witness who would testify that God is full of grace and God is full of mercy. And it does not matter how far you stray from God. If you make your way back to it, he'll show you that grace and that mercy. That's why every once in a while we got to go back to those old numbers and sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Say, a rich like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed through many dangers. Hey, toils and snares. I have already come. But grace is what's brought me safe thus far. And old folk used to say, that same grace is going to lead me home. I tried to tell you about the power of Nebuchadnezzar. I tried to tell you about the pride of Nebuchadnezzar. Tried to tell you about the punishment of Nebuchadnezzar. But let me close this morning by telling you about the proclamation of Nebuchadnezzar. Because the Bible says that after seven long years, God turned his situation around. And I'm just wondering, uh, is there anybody watching today uh, that can testify that we serve a God of the turn around? Uh, it does not matter how long uh, you've been in the situation. If you let God, He will turn it around. When He came out of the woods, God restored to Him everything that He lost because He finally admitted 
nine four. You can make your uh, you can mail in your donations to the Church of Game Jude, 1601 South Gate Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72206. Thank you so much for continuing to support the ministry. All right. Now, next Sunday is going to be a pull-up service, 11 o'clock a.m. We're inviting you to come and to remain in your cars. We're going to be set up outside on the sidewalk. Uh, uh, our, our musicians, our drummers, everybody, this, we're going to be outside next Sunday. Weather permitting, we'll be outside. And uh, we're going to let our members park over here. And we're just going to have a good time. We're going to have communion. We're going to serve communion. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time next Sunday at 11 a.m. Zoom Sunday School is going to be starting next Sunday as well. You can look for instructions in your Friday email. Uh, Lord willing, this coming Friday, you should have uh, instructions on how to get on Zoom. Everything you need to know will be in those instructions. So please, please, please uh, read your email. We know that there may be some uh, senior members, elderly members that, you know, don't do the whole computer thing, email. You know, it would be nice if some of our younger people would join up, link up <clears throat> with our uh, season sites and uh, so that they can uh, see the Sunday school lesson as well. Zoom is set up where we'll be able to see each other just like we're in class. For right now, everybody's going to be in one class for now. Everybody's going to be in one class, and uh, we'll have one teacher teaching each Sunday. All of that will be in the email. We'll share it all with you. Um, I want to say happy birthday to our first lady, Sister Keelan Mintz, celebrating her birthday like yesterday. Everybody clap it up for the first lady. We want to be in prayer for Sister Gloria Carroll, who funeralized her sister-in-law this past week, and for Sister B.J. Woods, who funeralized her uncle on this past weekend. Please, let's keep everybody in prayer. I think that's everything to claim our attention today. Sister Alex, it's so good to see you, honey. Amen. In the Navy, I think she's moving